Zechariah chapter 3, please. Zechariah chapter 3. We have been looking at, and we will be looking at, the gospel in the Old Testament. The gospel in the Old Testament. It is of great misfortune that what is at least two-thirds of the word of God, about 70%, is often ignored. Many churches say the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New, therefore it has no meaning because they're misunderstanding the word fulfilled and what the word fulfilled means. We are told the law is our pedion to point us to Christ, but we're also told that the Old Testament is mostly meat. The New Testament is mostly milk, according to Hebrews 5 and 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Some churches will only read the Old Testament, usually from the book of Psalms, devotionally. This is unfortunate. The Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, are the only scriptures the first Christians ever had, and it is much the word of God and as important as is the New Testament. But it contains also the same message, the message of Jesus and his salvation. And we'll be looking at that now, Zechariah chapter now by way of background most of you know the book of Zechariah is <clears throat> concurrent with the post-exilic period the time of Ezra Nehemiah and Haggai the people come back from Babylon as predicted and promised by certainly Jeremiah but also by Isaiah and Daniel they're back in their land at least some of them are attempting to rebuild the temple, reestablish Jerusalem, etc., under the royal decree issued by the benevolent Medes and Persians. Meanwhile, Haggai, Nehemiah, and Ezra show us what is happening in time and space, show us what transpired historically, the opposition of Sanballat and the Samaritans and their enemies, and the struggles they had to motivate the people. Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah show us what happened historically. Zechariah does something else. Its literary genre is more apocalyptic than historical narratives. Zechariah lifts up the curtain apocalyptically and shows us what is transpiring in heaven. At the same time, these events are happening on earth with Ezra and Nehemiah and Haggai. The conflicts, the battles that we see on earth are always an extension and a reflection of a battle in the heavenlies. The book of Daniel shows us this. The book of Job shows us this. And perhaps above all, the book of Revelation shows us this. The conflicts we experience on the earth, be it the nation Israel, be it the true church, be it us, the conflicts we are having on earth are always a reflection and an extension of a conflict happening in the heavenlies and will continue to happen in the heavenlies until Satan is cast down and he inhabits the person of Antichrist. Um, That is, of course, future and prophetic. It's a coming event. But right now, we're looking at the general principle. The conflicts we have personally as a church, the conflicts besetting national Israel and the Jews are always a reflection of the conflict happening in the heavenlies. We think of Moses lifting up his hands to pray during the battle. The outcome of world events is always determined by what happens in the heavenlies, what God does or what God doesn't do. And of course, what Satan is trying to do. Read with me, please, to Zechariah chapter 3, the gospel in the Old Testament found in Zechariah 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan at his right hand to oppose him. Now, Joshua Yehoshua was pronounced Yeshua, same name as Jesus, Yeshua, after the Babylonian captivity in the Hebrew dialect of Chaldee. Jesus would have been known as Yeshua, but the name actually would have been Joshua, much like we have Yohan or Johannes, 
we would just say John, but the original name was Johannes or Johann. In Hebrew, Yohanan, John the Baptist. Okay, Yohanan Hamadbil. So Jesus had the name of Joshua. Now that is important in itself and has a meaning in itself. Joshua represents Jesus in his second coming, the one who will establish the Messianic kingdom in the land, bringing the people of God with him to depose the forces of darkness. But I digress. He showed me Joshua, the high priest. Now, the high priest is, of course, we know from Hebrews, a type of Christ. But he is the representation of the people. He is the representation of the people. He is a shadow of the eternal mediary, Jesus the righteous. God became a man. In order to be our high priest, Jesus had to become incarnate as a human to identify with us in order to be our mediator and our propitiation. The Old Testament high priest is a shadow of that. We are taught in the epistle to the Hebrews. He showed me Joshua the high priest, the Kohen Gadol, standing before the angel of the Lord. Adonai, with the definite article. Where you see the definite article, Adonai, the angel of the Lord, this is always a Christophany, a Christophany, an Old Testament appearance and often an Old Testament enfleshment of Christ. Yes, there's something unique and very special about the incarnation of Jesus and fulfillment of Isaiah 14. But that does not set a precedent. Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord. The angel of the Lord went before the tribes of Israel. The angel of the Lord was seen by Manoah, the parents of Samson. Jesus appeared even in physical form as the angel of the Lord. Now, in Judaism, particularly in Hasidic Judaism, which is plagued by mysticism, Gnosticism, and occult Kabbalah, they call the angel of the Lord the Metatron, the one on back of, next to, or at the center of the throne, the Metatron. And they have all kinds of wrong identifications of him. Some identifying him with some archangelic being, some identifying him with Enoch and so forth. We know that the angel of the Lord, the one they call the Metatron, is the Lord Jesus. It is not Enoch or some mere angelic being or archangelic being. It is the Messiah. He is the one at the center or in the back of the throne of God. It is him. He is the angel of the Lord. Judaism has his identity wrong. He is the angel of the Lord. And interestingly, in the Zohar, a Kabbalistic book, it admits that he is the middle pillar of the Godhead. But I don't want to go there now. We have a teaching on the Metatron you can avail yourself of, and we show how Judaism misinterprets who the Metatron is, but the Metatron is actually just the angel of the Lord. It is the Messiah, Jesus, in eternity. So let's look at him. The high priest stands before the angel of the Lord, before the Son of God, before the Messiah, and Satan at his right hand to oppose him. Satan at his right hand to oppose him. Satan is the accuser of the brethren. He is always there at our right hand. As we stand before our maker, as we stand before God, as we stand before the Messiah, the accuser of the brethren is always there to accuse. We think Jesus is always with us by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Praise God, that is indeed true. I will never leave you or forsake you. Jesus is certainly always with us. But that doesn't mean the enemy isn't. He'll flee from you if you resist him. But he keeps showing his ugly face. Satan, standing at his right hand to oppose him. We are continually being opposed by the devil. We are continually being accused by the devil. 
More than that, because of our old nature, because of the fallen nature of the world and of man, he has plenty of ammunition that we've given him to use against us. We are actually guilty of many of the things he accuses us of. See, you see, you see, there's your son. He's born again. She's born again. Look what she just did. He's always there to accuse continually, day and night. And he tries to bring condemnation upon us. There is no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. <coughs> because of the atonement. Because Jesus took the guilt for what we did and paid the price for what we did, there is no condemnation. But that's not to say we are not guilty of many of the things, not necessarily all, but much, if not most, of what we are accused of. He is there. He is the accuser. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. <coughs> the rebuking of Satan can only be done by someone more powerful than him. Even when the angel Michael contended with the body of the corpse of Moses on Harnavo, Mount Nebo, his response was, the Lord rebuke you. Satan was the most powerful angel. He was not only the most powerful angel, he was the covering cherub. He was the most powerful being that God could create or had created without replicating himself. So powerful is Satan, he actually thought he could usurp the place and position of God. And that is what his nature is, to replace God. That's how powerful. When you see people saying, without thinking what they're saying, we rebuke you, Satan, hallelujah. No, we rebuke you in the name of Jesus. We have no power over Satan. Only Jesus does. He empowers us. It is the power of Christ in us that enables us to overcome, to outgun, as it were, the enemy. He's just too powerful. The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Even Michael, the archangel, did not make light of him. You see these, I've heard some silly preachers go around with a chain saying, come down here, Satan, we're going to bind you. They can thaw you over you. You don't see this in scripture. He is a very formidable enemy. Yes, he was defeated by Jesus on the cross and in the resurrection by a master gambit. By a master gambit, he was outplayed by the Lord. He was defeated. And ultimately, he will be destroyed by the Lord. And the Lord will do that in league with and through the faithful church. The Lord of glory will trample Satan under your feet. But the church cannot conquer Satan. Only Jesus can. In the book of Revelation, where Satan is cast down when he's fighting with Michael, it is the Lord who empowers Michael. In Hebrew, he was like unto God, Mikael, only because of the empowerment of the Lord in Michael. Could Michael cast Satan down? Or could Satan be cast down? We could never defeat him in our own strength or our own power. Never. But most of us know that, but let's be very careful when we speak about rebuking the enemy. Yes, he can be rebuked. He must be rebuked, but we must theologically and doctrinally understand what that means. We are invoking the power of God to do it. We are not invoking our own power. You can't push your own car up a 45-degree hill. You need somebody a lot stronger than you are. You need Samson to push it up the hill. So we cannot defeat or rebuke or bind Satan in our own strength. We need the Lord to do it, not simply with us, but virtually for us, although he includes us in the process. The victory, the strength, the power is his. Let's look. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who's chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Remember, with Sanballat and so forth, in the saga of Ezra and Nehemiah, 
when they were attempting to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and then the temple, they faced nothing but opposition. This opposition they got from Sanballat and Tobias and so forth that we see in the post-exilic prophets, these were people motivated by Satan. What is happening today in the world? Our opponents are being motivated by Satan. I watched the film clip this weekend. We addressed it on Moriel catching up. A member of a school board dressed like a cat, saying that the official position of the school board is to indoctrinate children with the LGBTQ, and therefore Christian teachers should not be hired because they go against the policies of, of LGBTQ promulgation among children. Don't hire Christian teachers. They're, they're a threat. How long is it going to be before they say Christians can't be policemen? I had a friend who was a very experienced fire chief. He's now with the Lord and Mercy Side, Liverpool, England. As a saved Christian, he refused to march in a quote-unquote gay parade and was forced to resign and take early pension. These people who do these things, who promote the LGBTQ agenda, as one example, these are people who are motivated, and in some cases, even animated by Satan. They're animated by Satan. Ezra and Nehemiah, read in light of Zechariah, show us this. These people with these antichrist agendas, these morally debased agendas, these people who are given over to reprobation, to to, uh, reprobate minds, these people are controlled by the devil. The real enemy was not Sanballat and Tobias. We struggle not against flesh and blood. The real enemy are not these promulgators of the homosexual or same-sex agenda or pro-abortion agenda. They are simply the stooges of Satan. They are his stooges. God doesn't have stooges. God has children. God has disciples of jesus god has soldiers in his army both on heaven and on earth the armies of god in the heavens are called seva ota shemaim the hosts of heavens but the hebrew word means army so too paul compares our role to, to being in a legion to being soldiers in an army and we're told in ecclesiastes there's no discharge from war You can't get out of this army. Anybody who tries to get out of God's army when the war is going on is a deserter and a backslider. We will have the victory. But in the meantime, there is no discharge from war. It is a military conflict. We need to think of spiritual warfare in terms of something illustrated by strategic warfare. Of course, we have an undefeated an undefeatable commander-in-chief. But there are casualties. But there are battles. Ultimately, we win. Ultimately, our God is indefeatable. And Satan will be indefensible. He'll have no way out. But now the war goes on. And so we read, the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. They were trying to prevent the work of Ezra and Nehemiah with the restoration of their capital and with the restoration of their temple. This is going on now. The efforts of Islam and the political left to oppose Israel and to oppose Israel's presence and its ancient God-given capital, they're trying to oppose this, to defend the Temple Mount. Now, ultimately, when the temple is rebuilt, the Antichrist will actually defile it with the abomination of desolations. All of these conflicts you see happening in the Middle East, particularly those conflicts centered around Jerusalem, are a reflection of a spiritual battle. Satan is determined. And it's happening. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? something rescued out of the fire. John Wesley applied this verse to himself as a baby. His father was an Anglican vicar, 
in Doncaster, England, in Epworth. <coughs> and the house caught fire when he was a baby. And he was rescued from this burning house. And he always described himself as a brand plucked from the fire. <coughs> you and I are brands plucked from the fire. The rest of the world is going to hell. They're going to hell without Christ. I was on my way back from the optician today. I was trying to witness to a couple of Jehovah's Witnesses. Friendly enough people, but deluded in darkness. Thought they were preaching the truth and they were preaching error. They're on their way to hell. I was on my way to hell, but I am a brand plucked from the fire. You, if you were a saved Christian, were on your way to hell. By the grace of God, we are brands plucked from the fire, as it were. Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. You and I stand before the Lord covered with filthy garments. But let's look at some of the parallel passages highlighting these things found elsewhere, mainly in the Old Testament. Look with me, please, to Psalm 109, verse 6. Set a wicked man over him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. The accuser is at the right hand. He's at our right hand before the Lord accusing us. We're praying. Dear Lord, forgive me for this. Dear Lord, help me to do that. Dear Lord, thank you for what you did. Praise your name, O Lord. Well, the enemy is right there, accusing, mocking, obsessively driven by the wickedness of his own nature. And will continue to do so until his coming destruction. But let's look. The Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you. And this resembles something from the book of Jude and the book of Romans. But we're mainly looking at the Old Testament. Verse 2, the Lord rebuke you. Look at Amos chapter 4, verse 11, please. The Hebrew prophet Amos. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah which will happen again, the coming judgment of God on the radical homosexual and lesbian world. I'd point you to our recorded teaching on our website, not even a minion. But look, you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet you've not returned to me in this case. The Lord rescued us from certain destruction. And he always wants us to return to him. Well, let's go further with this. Look at Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, please. With filthy garments, Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all like an unclean thing. All of our righteousness are as filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf and our iniquities like the wind have taken us away. Our righteousness are like filthy rags. I've explained this once before, but since it is in the text and in the co-text, I'll explain it again briefly. All of our righteousness is as filthy rags. Man cannot save himself through his own works. It is only the righteousness, the work of Jesus on the cross and in his resurrection that can save us. When he took our sin and atoned, died in our place and rose to give eternal life. It is only what he did that can give salvation. 
Our own works cannot save. As we always say, as we always reiterate without hesitation, saved Christians do good works because we have been saved, not in order to get saved. We have been saved in part, (coughs) in large part, to do good works. But we've been saved to do the works. We don't do the works to get saved. It won't work. We are unclean before the Lord. Our efforts will fail. Now, the term used here for a polluted garment, as it is sometimes translated, there were, of course, no feminine hygiene products in the ancient world. Tampons or Tampex or things of this nature didn't exist. Women used rags. Women simply used menstrual cloths that would become bloodied. And by the law of Moses, anything contacting menstrual blood was ritually unclean. It was no tahor, not pure. It was defiling. What does it mean our righteous deeds are as a blood-soiled menstrual cloth? It is this. If you look at a young couple battling infertility and they go to a fertility clinic and they're trying to conceive a child and they try with IVF and things like this, the last thing that young couple wants to see is a menstrual period. It's the last thing. Because physiologically, every menstrual period represents a failed pregnancy. Every menstrual period represents a failed conception, a failed birth. The birth cannot happen. It's just going to bleed out. The ovum are going to come out with it. There'll be no fertilization, no capacitation, nothing. It's just going to bleed out. There will be no birth. And uh, even in the best conditions, clinically, you only have about a one-third, usually, percent chance of conceiving with artificial insemination and these other means. It's very, very difficult. The last thing they want is, is, is a menstrual period. Last thing they want. It's just a bloody mess. Represents failure. Lack of success. Heartbreak. This, this couple or couples like this. Our efforts to save ourselves by good works are like, like this. The same as the bloody cloth shows there will be no birth. Our own works, our work righteousness shows there can be no second birth all of our righteous deeds are as filthy rags we cannot produce second birth by our own means it is something only god can do by his spirit through his son we cannot do it it has to be his works not ours our works are doomed to fail our works are doomed to fail just like a soiled, blood-soiled menstrual cloth. It represents the failure of a birth. So it is the failure of a second birth. You cannot get to heaven through our works. We do our works because we're on our way to heaven because of the works of Jesus. This is the perhaps most fundamental difference between religion and the gospel. Okay, but I... Again, we have other teachings explaining this, the differences between religion and the gospel. So it is. It's it's just a mess. We extend this to our overall wardrobe. We are filthy. We are covered with dirt. We are in a fallen world. Remember at the Paschal Seder we call the Last Supper, a Passover meal. Peter said, wash all, all, all of me. Jesus said, you're already clean. Wash with the water of the word. It's only your feet. Our feet come in contact with the world. The world gets our clothes dirty. You think when you're riding to work on the subway or the tube. You think when you're you're perspiring and sweating, when you're working outdoors in in in, in a warm, hot climate. You just think 
just general contact with the soot in the atmosphere if you live near any kind of a of urban or industrialized environment. These clothes just naturally get dirty. They just get... Well, that's what the world does to us spiritually. It is entirely natural for us to get filthy. It is unavoidable. It is unavoidable. The problem is there's not a dry cleaner or a laundromat or a washing machine on the face of the earth that can help us. God told Israel, you scrub with the fuller's soap and you're still not clean. Nothing can get our garments clean except the blood of Jesus. No detergent, no bleach. Only the blood of Jesus can give us spotless garments. Again, it depends on him. We all have a filthy wardrobe. Doesn't matter how expensive the clothes are. They're going to get dirty. Well, let's look. People can try to buy good quality clothes. Mm -hmm. I have a tweed suit that I got in Ireland. They have good tweed in Ireland and Scotland. Most tweed comes from Ireland and Scotland, real tweed. And it's handcrafted. They've been making it for generations, centuries. And it suits the climate of the Hebrides Islands or of Ireland with the cold rain and the damp and so forth. Well, this is a suit that doesn't need much pressing. It's a wrinkle-proof suit. All you need to do is hang it up and smooth it down with your hand, and it looks like it has been pressed. It's really good quality to have a tweed suit, for instance. Good quality. But it still picks up dirt. It doesn't matter how good the quality. It could be cashmere. It could be satin. It could be tweed. It could be anything. It is going to get dirty. No matter how much someone invests in their wardrobe, they cannot have clean garments. No matter how righteous somebody tries to be in their own righteousness, they cannot have clean garments. Our garments are going to be filthy. God sees all the specks. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, the Lord's chosen Jerusalem. <coughs> rebuke you. Is this but a brand plucked from the fire? <coughs> Notice. The Lord does not direct or contradict the accusations of Satan. Yes, he did it. Yes, she did it. <coughs> yes, they are that. He does not defend their sin. He defends them. Yeah, I know what they are. But they were brand plucked from the fire. I know his mistakes, his faults. I know her sins. I know their weaknesses. I know the sin that so easily besets them. But the Lord has chosen Jerusalem. Yes, I know about them. I know what you're saying, Satan. I know that already. But they're a brand Pluck from the fire. The Lord does not defend our sin. He atones for our sin. What he defends is us. Doesn't defend what we did or do. But he defends us. It's quite a thing. Let's look. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood by him. Before saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you, and I will clothe you with rich robes. And I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by. Now I'll take verse 5 first. Verse 5 alludes back or refers back to Exodus 29, to the special vestments worn by the high priest, Joshua being a high priest, on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. I mentioned that in passing. But let's look at verse 4. Take the filthy garments off him and give him 
some clean ones. Look with me, if you will, please, first of all, to Isaiah chapter 64, verse 6, and then 61.10. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah. We are all like unclean things. Our righteousness is like filthy rags. But now let's look at Isaiah 61.10. A verse we've quoted often. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. He's clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a garment decks himself with ornaments and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. These garments are the garments of salvation. Now, we are told that when man fell, he lacked the garments of righteousness. Adam and Eve in the garden with the nakedness representing the fallen state of man. The church of Laodicea does not know what it's blind, is oblivious to its true condition. It is deluded, it is auto-deluded, it is self-deceived and satanically deceived by religiosity. You say, I have need of nothing. It was misusing material wealth as a barometer of God's blessing and favor, not knowing you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. Somebody can take off their filthy garments, but they're still not wearing anything. They need to be clothed with the robes of righteousness. As Isaiah puts it here, he's covered me with the robe of righteousness. He's clothed me with the garments of salvation. Coat of righteousness, Yaatani, he gives me. It's very beautiful in the original Hebrew text from a literary and prose perspective. Okay. So let's go back now to Zechariah. Chapter 3. <coughs> what we see then is something else. It begins to use the language in Isaiah of an adornment of bridal adornment that language of bridal adornment that follows the or or is is um part of the the wardrobe uh of 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 the robes of righteousness and the garments of salvation the the adornment is picked up on in the book of revelation when the perfected bride of christ will be like a bride adorned for her husband for the marriage supper of the lamb and so forth okay so god does not simply dress up his bride he adorns his bride and of course we have poetic references to this additionally in the song of solomon nonetheless let's continue looking these things we see in revelation and so forth come from the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, we cannot properly understand what the New Testament is talking about in Revelation or Revelation chapter 3 or Revelation chapter 20 and 21 and so forth unless we go back to the Hebrew Scriptures. 
you will have a very superficial understanding of the New Testament unless you understand it in light of the depth of the old, which is what we're trying to do in teachings like this. In verse 6, Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua. Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my command, you shall also judge my house and likewise have charge of my courts. I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. Now this alludes to the status of faithful believers in the millennium as a kingdom of priests. We will be empowered for a thousand years in the messianic kingdom. We will be the power elite, as it were, of the world. It'll not be Silicon Valley tycoons or corrupt bankers on Wall Street or the city of London. It'll not be globalists in the World Economic Forum. It'll not be dictators running nations like China. The power elite, the rulers, the meek will inherit the earth. It'll be the people of the Lord Jesus. If we walk in his ways, he cleans us up and gives us a new outfit. Walk in my ways. I'm preparing you to co-reign with my son. Now, of course, that will be true on earth. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. But then, of course, ultimately, it'll be in heaven. Here, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I'm bringing forth my servant, the branch. When you see that term, branch, netzer, it is talking about the Lord Jesus. He's going to bring about his netzer. Look with me, please, if you will, to Psalm 71, verse 7. In you, O Lord, I put my trust. Let me never be put to shame. Deliver me in your righteousness and cause me to escape. Incline your ear to me and save me. Be my strong refuge to whom I may resort continually. You've given the commandment to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. Deliver me, O my God, out of the hand of the wicked, out of the hand of the unrighteous and cruel man. He will deliver us out of the hand of the accuser, of the righteous and the cruel man. But let's understand further what it's telling us. Look at Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, about this branch. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my elect one, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. He'll not cry out, nor raise his voice, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice and truth. He will not fail nor be discouraged till he has established justice on the earth. More about this righteous branch. Look with me, please, to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem, same Hebrew root of Jesse. A branch shall grow out of his roots, and the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. A prophecy about Jesus. He is the branch whom Zechariah 
predicts is coming, who will achieve these things, who will give us these clean garments, who will be a refuge from the cruel one who accuses us. Let us continue looking at this. Look with me, please. Isaiah 53, verse 2. He'll grow up before him like a tender plant, as a root out of dry ground. A prophecy about the Messiah. Let us continue looking. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5, please. Yermiyahu Hanavi. Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 5. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord. I will raise to David, Messiah is the descendant of King David, a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness on the earth. A prophecy about the Messiah. He is the righteous branch. The only way to have these clean garments, the only way to be rescued from this accuser is because of the righteous branch. Verse 9 of Zechariah chapter 3, Behold the stone that I've laid before Jerusalem. Upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I engrave its inscription, says the Lord, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in that day. Now this has references in Psalm 118 verse 22 once again. <coughs> Quoted in the New Testament. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. <laughs> this is Jesus. He would be rejected by the people at the behest of the Sanhedrin. He is the cornerstone. The cornerstone <coughs> in Hebrew is called Rosh Pina. Rosh Pina. The head of the corner. It is not a cornerstone as we have in modern edifices. In modern edifices, the cornerstone is the dedication stone, indicating usually in Roman numerals and Latin numbers, the year of its construction. <laughs> okay. It's not that. The Rosh Pina is most likely, in the opinion of some scholars, the central stone of an arch. The central stone of an arch is the head one that holds the others in place with tension. It, its strength and its position holds the other stones in tension to make an arch. There are many examples of this in Israel. One of the best is in the synagogue ruins in Kordazin, in Galilee, near Capernaum. Uh, you see the Rosh Pinat. The cornerstone that was rejected, the building block that was rejected, the Rosh Pina that was rejected, has become the cornerstone of a whole new world. Although rejected, he became the way of salvation to the Gentiles and to the world. This is Jesus. Now, the eyes in the stone, of course, are an apocalyptic image in the book of Revelation and so forth. Uh, we won't go there now, but bear in mind, it is Jesus. Okay, let's continue looking now. For behold the stone that I have laid before Joshua. Upon the stone of seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription. I will remove the iniquity of the land in that day. And that day, says the Lord of hosts, everyone will invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. 
these things again hint at what it's going to be like when Jesus returns and sets up his kingdom. So we have this situation. We stand before the Lord and we are filthy. And the devil is standing next to us at our right hand saying, look at him, look at her. She's filthy. They crawled out of a gutter. Look at her. And the Lord says, I know. But they're a brand plucked from the fire. Put clean garments on them, the garments of salvation. <clears throat> and then adorn them. <coughs> Transform them. Cinderella on steroids. When applied to the church corporately. But it applies to us individually. He gives us the garments of salvation. <coughs> well, how can he do this? How can this happen when we are unrighteous? It happens because of the righteous branch. Our true high priest who makes intercession for us. Jesus. That's what it's saying. We can't save ourselves. We need the righteous branch to save us. We can't have a suitable wardrobe acceptable to the Lord. He has to give it to us. We can't do anything in and of ourselves. And the accuser is right there to remind God and to remind us of that fact. But by the grace of God, we are brands plucked from a fire. Satan accuses us of being what we were and even what we are. We stand indicted about what we were and what we are. But the Lord sees what we shall be. He looks at us and he pictures that beautiful new suit of clothes he has for each and every one of us. That he has for us individually and that he has for the church corporately when it's adorned. The Lord sees what we're going to look like. He sees the beauty in Cinderella when she seems like a peasant girl with a tattered dress. No, he sees the ruby shoes. He sees the beautiful ballroom gown. He sees the end. Satan accuses us of what we were and of what we are. God addresses us for what we're going to be, what we can be if we continue to walk in his ways, what we shall be. And he does this because of the righteous branch. The righteous branch. The angel of the Lord is in heaven. It is the manifestation of Christ in eternity. He comes to earth at various times in the Hebrew scriptures, but this is taking place in heaven. But he will come as a man, as the righteous branch, as what was promised to David. He will come, and he has come, and he is coming again. God bless and have a wonderful and blessed weekend in Jesus. Thank you so much for joining us.